Welcome back to GM Worldwide Radio. This is Unfiltered, presented by Street Smart Society. Always remember, get your graphic arts, graphic design, and video editing done at Street Smart Society. Hit them up on Street Smart Society LLC or Street Smart, Street Smart Society .com. And, uh, you know, the time of this is who and what Wednesday. Y'all gonna worry about the what a little later, but we got the who in the house. Pittsburgh legend, producer, all-around cool dude, j Pad the juggernaut, in the building. What up, though? How y'all doing? So... What's going on, fellas? How y'all doing today? Man? Good. Good. Yeah, you mean, good. You see what's what going on before we got on the second? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Shout out to everybody out here in grind mode doing their thing. You already know what it is. Grind mode, worldwide radio. Make sure y'all tune in, man. I'll say this is the man behind the grind mode theme song. Yes, indeed. <laughs> behind the grind mode, that, as we now know, it is definitely me. You know what I'm saying? I'm behind there. That's me and the voice and all that. You already know what it is, man. Uh, Shout out to voice show? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, that was okay. me. Yeah, that was me. All, we be all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So uh, Nina wasn't me though. That that was her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so give everybody the background, man. Because you've been around so long, it's like people don't remember the beginning. Okay. All right, boy. We're gonna go way, way back, or we're gonna go back. I'll tell you what, let's condense it down. Um Literally, I started off like way back, like when hip hop first started, I pretty much got my start. You know what I mean? Before then, um, I'd say like roughly around the age of maybe six or seven, I started playing instruments. I started playing instruments. Um, that was uh, my big thing. I used to love, you know, listening to records when I was a kid. So by the time I was like seven, that was like maybe in the, in the late 70s. You know what I'm saying? I said, I turned seven years old. I picked up trombone. I was in middle school or grade school, grade school, grade school, picked up the trombone. And um, I still play it to this day, but then it just progressed into other things. You know what I mean? Like, you know, through high school, you know, made district band a couple of times, uh, you know, did a couple of uh, uh, big significant things. I used to play in the jazz band. I used to play a little bit of this, a little bit of that. At the same time, I was uh, starting JV basketball. Um, I maintained a three nine throughout high school. Uh, it was pretty pretty. I died, graduated at the top of my class, damn near. You know what I mean? Which is you no know, neither here nor there. But that's that's saying a little something. Um, you know, as far as uh, as far as outside of that, when I really started getting heavy into production, I'd say it was like I graduated from high school in like ninety. Okay. You know what I mean? I graduated from high school in ninety, and um, as soon as I graduated, like like the year after that, like I had this had this crazy little job up in the Erie. That's where I'm from. If, if, since y'all you know, if y'all want to know, from Erie, Pennsylvania, a uh, little city right outside of Buffalo, about maybe 45 minutes. You know what I mean? So, whatever weather Buffalo gets, that's what I grew up in. Um, but uh, getting back to the music thing, uh, when I graduated high school, um, back in '90, it's when I bought my first sequencing keyboard. And then I bought a drum machine and uh, I cat had a, um, what they had a cassette four track. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that was the first recording device that I had, you know what I'm saying? Before then we were just tape to tape in it. We were just tape to tape in it. Oh, I, nice. was, I was a beatbox. That was my thing. Okay. When I was seven years old, I, I, I'd have to go back to it real quick. Uh, my first thing in hip hop was beatbox. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Cause I was too chubby. I was a chubby kid, you know what I'm saying? So I was too chubby to break dance. I wasn't, I couldn't. I couldn't was gonna say, I, was, I thought you might have been popping along and break dance. Man, I was waving. I, I could wave. That was about, you know, I could do the, this, this. I, I, outside of that, man, you can forget that shit. I was done. Toasted. You get me on some cardboard, I ain't moving. You know what I'm saying? The cardboard is moving. I'm not moving. You know what I mean? So. Um, but I found another talent that I had, and it was beatboxing. I could make a lot of different sounds with my mouth, and uh, they gave me the microphone one day. It was plugged into the beatbox, man, and I started beatboxing, and it started sounding like what was coming out the radio off the tape. Right. And they had me they had me beatbox over the beats at first, and then I would go in and I would just start making my own my own drum tracks, like my own beats. And um, shout out to a cat from Erie, man. His name is A Money. He know who I he know, he know who he is, but I was his beatbox. You know, what I'm saying A Money was one of the top rappers in town at that time. We couldn't have been no older than ten. You know, what I'm saying we had the boys and girls club and all the competitions, and I'm beatboxing with my Kangol on, and and they got their Kangols on, and and we all was just just we was just a crew. You know what I mean? And we really were a hip hop crew at that time. And 
I don't know if we even won any of those competitions, but it was a lot of learning, a lot of this, that, and the third. And and I beatboxed for a long time. I beatboxed for a while. And then I got into production, you know? I got into production. I got back. I took a little break from high school when I got into college from playing instruments. Okay. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I kind of like was, was doing the college experience thing, but that's where I really started experimenting with rapping mm -hmm. and other things as well. And then I got back into playing music again. You know what I mean? So I might have took maybe like... I want to say maybe a year or two off from really doing music full time because I was getting into that college thing. I went to Penn State. Okay. I was a film major at Penn State. Um, make a long story short on that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's where I really started getting heavier into production. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I got the sequencing keyboard. I started acquiring these things through through college. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Uh, you know, the tracking machine, then I got a reel to reel. And, uh, you know, I've had a, I had a record player shitload of vinyl. My first setup was a really intricate, interesting setup. It was in the basement of a crib on Fourth and Reed in Erie. I mean, this place was damn near abandoned. Like it was like it was like a squatter crib. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you literally could consider this a squatter house. I would get up at like, man, dude, I get up at like five, six o'clock in the morning. And you know, everybody else that was around me, you know, they was hustling. They was selling weed, whatever, you know what I'm saying? We all would, we all took our turns at that shit, man, standing out on the corner. You know, back then, that's how I used to sell weed. Like, you you didn't call nobody and say, yo, I'm coming to get me a bag. No, no, you'd be out on the corner saying, I got nicks, I got dimes, you know what I'm saying? Shit like that. So that was part of the thing, we small time hustling, but the main thing that I was really doing was I was getting knee deep into uh, learning this equipment. And uh, so what happened, what the basic original setup that I had was a turntable, a Gemini sampler, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I had uh, I had a RY30 drum machine by Yamaha. Okay. It was like a big ass square joint. It was like this, you know what I'm saying? It was big and it had big ass pads and it could make a lot of different sounds. It was really kind of like a dope drum machine. So I, that was my drum machine. Then I also had an Alesis SR16, you know what I'm saying? Which they still sell that in the store to this day, which is amazing to me that they still sell the same unit that I used to use back in the 90s. Hey, man, I mean, and so good products, man. they were good products and they definitely did their thing. So we we were more, since we couldn't afford the MPC and all that stuff right off the bat, and the MPC really didn't get relevant when I first started. Okay. No, no, you really, MPC was probably in its earliest, earliest forms when I first really got heavy into the production. And the people that really were using it were um were the people that kind of like were the were the main guys back then the love uh, uh what's his name um not love buck starcy but uh but um but no no marley marl you know he he was one of the big guys that had the drum machine he had uh him and krs one and them and you know a couple of those guys had it had those 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 rolling drum machines those those big time drum machines so whatever we could get we got you know I, what i mean I made it work. yeah we made it work we had a little sample in this a little bit of this a little bit of that and the, the setup was real basic, man. It had an old, old rusty little um, like receiver. You know what I mean? The receiver was rusty as hell. Everything was Jimmy rigged together. You know what I'm saying? I don't think it was run right. You know what I mean? It probably wasn't linked in right. And then our, you know, our little four track, it was dingy. You know what I'm saying? It didn't have the cassette door on it. It was, you know, and then back then, which was really interesting, and, and a lot of people should count their blessings. Um, about the way that technology is to this day. And that's probably why it's like child's play to me now mm -hmm. is because of the fact that we had a tedious chore back then and we had what they call generation loss. We had generation loss when it came to the sound of the music because you only had four tracks to play with. So the beat went on one track and you had three tracks to play with and then all those could be bounced to the fourth track. Then you would have more tracks to, to lay stuff over, but you would experience what they call generation loss, you know what I'm saying? And this is just something that happened with cassette tape, you know what I'm saying, where, where you, would, you would dub and then you would dub over and you would dub over and find, eventually the tape start wearing out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And almost the same thing with that. So we had a lot of different obstacles that we had, to, we had to overcome back then and then things started eventually getting easier. Like I didn't see the first digital recorder till like maybe late 90s, you know what I'm saying? Late 90s, 98. 99 is when it started being commercial, when you started seeing, okay, it was still a four track, but it was made by Fostex and it was digital. And it had a SCSI drive on the back of it. And it's, it had these huge ass zip zip disks. Uh, that, floppy joints? Floppy zip disks. <laughs> they, not just floppies, but zips. You know what I'm saying? The floppies normally, you would catch those in certain sequencing, sampling, drum machines. Uh, 
uh, or sequencing keyboards like an ASR10 or ASRX. They used to have the little floppy drive on them, you know what I'm saying? Or a couple of those keyboards, early early keyboards had the floppy disk, you know what I'm saying? And you would stick it in and it, would, it was like the earliest form of uh, uh, what you would consider um, sequencing and, and digital things of that nature. You know what I'm saying? Those ASR 10s, um, I had one of those hanging around. ASR X, there was one hanging around after a while. Um, we had sampling drum machines after a while. Uh, Zoom, which was like, like I said, we couldn't avoid the big shit. So we had to, we had to overcompensate. Like we were the guys that used the uh, MTV music generator. You know what I mean? Funk Master Flex had a, had a, had a software. You remember that? Remember that game? Like it was a game, but it actually was the prototype to FL Studio. Okay. If you go back and you look at some of the early photos of music generator, which was Funk Master Flex's uh, game, the grid on there looks just like the grid on FL Studio. You know, it is right. Mean? I've seen it though, and I've only seen, I've only seen the uh, funk, the funk thing like once or twice in like, twice. documentaries. But I've yes. seen FL, and it looked basically the same. They look exactly. <laughs> they they pretty much made the prototype off of off of it. Had to. You know yeah. what I mean? Because MTV was in control of all that, and this, that, and the third. But uh, to make a long story short, that's what we had, man. And boy, I've had I had setup after setup after setup. We dealt with mini disc. I think I've dealt with every format of that you can possibly think of outside of just burning my own vinyl, creating my own vinyl. I've I've dealt with damn near every format of music, analog, digital. We man, we fucked up a lot when we did analog. Like we didn't know what we were doing, and we didn't have nearly all the pieces. And it's really really crazy to me now because it's like you have everything contained in the software that you used. You used to have to go buy the rack. You used to have to go buy the compressor, the EQ, the, and they all fit in a fancy little rack. And then your studio would look impressive as hell because you'd have this gigantic rig that's sitting around here. And then all of a sudden the computer came out and everything was sitting virtually in the, in the program. And I guess that's the reason why things, like I said, that's why things are much easier now. But I mean, that was just to give you all a brief of what's going on, man. But there's so many more stories that go from there. Saying that for the like, because I never, I never understood how much easier it got for producers over time compared to like the rap artists. Do you think that's some reason that some artists have become more lazy with their lyrics and stuff? Is oh, there's absolutely become easier for them. There's no question. There's no question that that this is a lazy age mm -hmm. of music. Uh, the golden era was the golden era for a reason because the level of creativity, the level of culture, the level of uh, of the authenticity of the of the music. Of, of hip hop itself was just there. Right. And now you have a lot of cloning. Yes. You have a lot of repetitiveness. You know what I'm saying? A lot of repeating, you know what I'm saying? Like you're, you're gonna get the name of the song no matter what, because they're gonna <laughs> repeat it like 10 <laughs> times throughout the chorus. And so, you know, those are, those are things that are a lot different than what, than what was going on back in the day. There was a lot more creativity. Um, it, was in a new, it was a new frontier, you know what I'm saying? There was a, a lot of fresh things happening. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. And you couldn't really mess up when you saw the cassette tape. You had to get it. No, 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 you would have to go back to the top of the tape, start it over again. And remember, every time you hit the record button, that tape is going to start losing the generation of quality. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, you definitely had to get it. Look, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm going to tell you a funny story. This, this is how tedious it was. And I think that this would really nip it in the bud right here because you just pointed out a very key point of how tedious it was as opposed to what it is now. The sampling, the Gemini sampler I had, had three to four banks on it, okay? And each one of those banks only had two seconds. So you could only get two seconds and you had to, and learn how to manually, because it was one circle and you had to manually tap that sample. And, and to get, and, and that's something that producers could take from this is that supreme timing is key. And I, and I highly recommend that you get something that you can tap or that you can play, you know what I'm saying? Because it'll make you a better, better player. Not only, not only will it make you a better musician, but it'll make you a better producer all the way around. If you can connect with a, an instrument of some sort, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be an instrument, but an instrument is damn near anything like, like a drum machine or like anything that you can creatively tap and put your, put your, put your hands to use and learn how to manually get things together, you'll be a, a so much better of a producer because one thing that really, really stuck out that with that with me was that I learned supreme timing because I had to manually tap that sample from the very beginning of the track to the end of it. 
there was no sequencing. I had to manually mm -hmm. by hand tap that sample and every time I fucked up I had to go yeah, back over yes and I had to manually tap that sample to the tempo of the drum machine blindly you know what I'm saying and hope that I got it right and the guys listened to it when it played back and it was like yep that's it right there yeah you got it Pat you know what I'm saying I'm gonna lean off of what he just said because it's something else that has struck me especially yeah. we did rap we have the segment rap jury on Thursdays we review music yeah and I was reviewing music three years ago and it was different. Like we were still back, like even though it was still getting simplified, we we're still doing four or five minute tracks, whole yes. CDs. Sure, sure. And then I come back in like August this year, we start restarting up. And I'm doing albums, I'm doing EPs. First thing, I'm doing mostly EPs. Which is right. And I'm doing like two, thir two minute songs, two 30 songs. And I'm just like, which is right. How do you, you got a hook in two, in two verses and maybe well, only hear the hook once. And you think <laughs> about it, it's because the, 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 the attention span of today's listener is that of a P. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, it, 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 and you heard that phrase before, the attention span is that of a P. What that means really is, is that your attention span is like this little, whereas opposed to back in the day, you had a wider palette of being able to listen and absorb what you were hearing. Now in day and this day and age is more compact. Everything is more jammed together. It's more, it's, it's like time is really of the essence in this day and age. So yeah, you got a party, but you only got two and a half minutes on this record. And, and DJ's gonna cut that down and get to the next record faster than than you than you than you can shake a stick at because this is the day and age and people's attention span in the club it's like that they get bored with that record it's not like back in the day when we used to be able to hear Lottie Dottie or we used to be able to hear Big Daddy Kane and listen to that record from the very front to the very end of it matter of fact the DJ will be cutting it up and bringing it back while it's playing through and it still make it go through the very end I I remember they used to do stuff like that to run DMC records in the club where they would have that record run for almost 20 minutes bro like 15 minutes swear yeah. to god like that's how hip-hop used to be and people were so infectious with that record that if you had the if you had the extended mix of the record you were the shit yeah i mean and you were the shit though no swear to god if you were a dj and you had the extended mix of a record that nobody else had you were the shit and you knew how to blend it and play it you know what i'm saying and that's why the djs had had such an instrumental thing with it as well but i'm just dancing all around the board because they all tie in together man it, man that manual sampling that all that shit right there man that shit was not easy bro that shit was tough and that's i guess that's kind of like what gives guys like me a leg up you know what i'm saying when it comes to learning uh, the learning curve you feel what i'm saying and 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 that's where you're going to get that attention span thing and that's where you're going to get all this other stuff too bro because back then the attention span was great now it's more accelerated high paced and that's why you have that's why you have things going on the way that you have you used to be able to do a five minute record and it was cool to be on the radio and everything now today's day and age you have what you call automated radio Automated radio has a playlist that they automatically play and, and it has to continuously be quick and it has to be because of the way that the radio is formatted now. You feel what I'm saying? So the, the standard radio record is three minutes and 30 seconds. And if you get outside of that realm, you're you're too far down the road. Right. You know what I'm saying? Now it's not a 16, it's a 12. It's just, it, unless your tempo is 90 and above. If you, if you get above 90, then you can get a couple of 16. You might be able to get three 16s in because the tempo is faster, and that means that the time can still stay three minutes and 30 seconds. But basically, you got to spend double time to math. It's very simple math. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing about uh, music. Music is, is math. And for people that don't understand that, I, I'll explain it again. Music is math. It's simple math. You know what I'm saying? And if, if you've mastered simple math, you can master music. So on the other note, because this what we were talking about is one of the big things in hip hop. The other thing is the, I would say the la the growing lack of respect for the producer, oh, and it's a combination yeah. of artists want like some artists like Ch Chance the Rapper aren't selling their music, so there's a disconnect between paying for the music if you're not selling the music, and then the record labels, specifically Atlantic, because I've been hearing of mostly about Atlantic going around this thing about, well, we got the record, but we're going to put it on the mixtape, so we're not going to pay you as much. <laughs> then six months later, the, the song ends up on an album, but we told you it was a mixtape. Yes. And both of those things, because I, like, you've been, first thing, first and foremost, the entire interview, you've been speaking of yourself as a musician, and I consider you that. Yeah. So the idea that they're lowballing you, and I think you're doing as much work as the artist, if not more, because producers more. are getting writing credits yeah. Yeah. on yeah. everything. Almost everything I look at, the producer has a writing credit next to the rapper. I have to, like, dive in deeper to make sure rappers aren't Absolutely. Right now. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing with that, guys, and I can shed some light on that, is that the roles, the roles have been extremely confused in music. You know what I'm saying? I don't think people really know what production means. 
I don't think people really know what an engineer actually his role and responsibility is or how many of them there are. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because you have a recording engineer, but you also have a mixing engineer and a mastering engineer. You know what I'm saying? Most of us are overcompensating because they 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 leave us out here like that, bro. You know what I'm saying? You have to learn how to be the mixer. You have yeah. to learn how to be the regular recorder and you have to learn how to master your own music damn there to make it yourself competitive in this day and age. Right. They give you the tools to do it, but the expertise and the know-how is where, where it all sits and where it lies and where the, where the problem is, bro. And the confusion is coming in is that the roles are getting, getting confused. The roles are getting confused and nobody knows what a producer is anymore because they're telling you that a producer is the person that makes the beat and they don't realize that that's just a musician. It's just a musician. That's not. That's not a producer. A producer is a person that actually has, shapes, molds, puts the song together. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He he may make the beat, but that's where they started coming in with those subtitles like super producer. Now super producer comes in because he's making the beat and he's also shaping and guiding the song into what it is mm -hmm. to make it a hit. Now see, there's another fine line with that as well. You know what I'm saying? Now you have a hit maker and then you have a producer. OK, then you also have, you know what I'm saying? We have different monikers and titles and things of that nature. And the, and the titles are getting confused, bro. They're, nobody's really <laughs> people are getting credit for production that are not producing. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, no, people are getting credit for <laughs> certain things. And you know what it is, bro? And, and it's called it's called habit. Okay. It's merely called habit, fellas. It's either you have a good habit of doing something or a bad habit. But one thing's for certain and two things for sure. You are practicing that thing religiously. You're practicing that whatever habit that you have religiously. So if it's a bad habit and, and people are practicing bad business tactics with music, see, it's, it's, it's this simple. I can't be at McDonald's and not know how to flip a burger. So I can't be in production or I can't be in this music business and not know what the rules and the regulations are. You know what I'm saying? And a mistake that I think a lot of people are making is that is that nothing's going out right. Nothing's going out properly. Not like that. That's the difference. Right. Everything you see on this on these walls here is the difference. Those are those are records that go out properly. Mm -hmm. That's where the mistake is being made. The roles are getting mixed up. I had to explain this to the guys recently. I closed my studio up here. Right. A lot of people don't know that I closed the studio within the last couple of weeks. Reason being though is is is, is it's not because of the fact that, that 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 I had a disgruntlement or a grudge or this that and the third. It's just business wise, I'm understanding that there's a lot of things that still need to be atoned here. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like there's things that, like, I can feed you some food, bro, and it can go in one ear and right out the other. You know what I'm saying? And it can easily happen because you're caught up in a bad habit. Bad habits are practiced. So if, you, if you're still practicing bad habits, it doesn't matter if I'm telling you the right thing and saying, look, we got to register this song. We got to put it through the system. We got to make this, this run properly. It's going to go one in, in one ear and right out the other because of the habit because of the habit. And that's what, that's the mistake that you're catching. Um, you're catching, you're catching the mistake because, because people are, are, are learning the business the wrong way. They're, they're thinking that going to that piff is going to get you the answer. They're, they're, they're being regulated to saying going to a live mixtapes is the answer. But see, if you don't have that stamp and that cosign from the industry, live mixtapes is not going to do shit for you. That piff is not going to do shit for you because of the mere fact that you don't have you don't have that stamp that everybody else has, or you don't have the capital to get the stamp. Right. And even if you get the stamp, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to make it. That doesn't guarantee anything. All that guarantees is that you have a stamp and then you, you may have a leg up, but you still got to show improvement. You still got to be who it is that you say you are. And that's another mistake that people are making. And on top of that, for y'all listening, just to get the information outside of the interview, when you do that, because I, um, I listen, I go to early hip hop time. If I see that your name is up on the promoted side and it doesn't seem like there's anything else but you paid for the promoted side, anybody like me could tell that you paid to get your thing at the top. Absolutely. But I have no clue if it's worth it still. Like you, you anybody can get four hundred dollars and put it on a website and then get your song put up to the top for forty eight hours. Key. That's key. That's clutch. That's clutch and key. And you must understand that this is exactly how the game goes, and they've turned it into a cash cow. You know what I'm saying? It's not really about whether you're talented anymore or whether you have the prowess to do this and to do that, it's whether you have the capital to make your shit move. 
You know what I'm saying? And anybody that doesn't look at it that way is a very foolish individual. You have to be very brutally honest with yourself. Know the business that you are in before you get in it. I can't, t I can't stress that enough. I've been doing this for 27 years of my life. I don't have to prove anything to anyone. The only thing I can possibly tell you and positively tell you is make sure you C-Y-A, cover your ass when you're in this business. If you don't cover your ass when you're in this business, you will be shit out of luck and you'll be spinning your wheels because I had to sit back one day and I had to be brutally honest with myself, fellas. I did a lot of recordings. I did a lot, a lot of recordings here, uh, a lot of production, a lot of the songs that I did, the recordings too, I made the beat to. And the mistake that I was making is that I wasn't looking at it like it was intellectual property. I was looking at it like it was just another leg up, another notch up, and hopefully these guys get motivated to want to push this record. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully. Instead of forcing their hand and saying, no, bro, we're not sitting down. We're not sitting down unless we're, we're doing this the right way. You know what I mean? I feel like that's like part, like that was basically my next question. Cause mm -hmm. I, we, for you and maybe like M. Tomlin and like a few other producers are the main producers that are on every project. Shout out to do. everybody that's doing their thing, by the way. Right. And, um, you know what I'm saying? We could sit there and say, okay, you know, and it's, and it is my time and I, I appreciate that and everything, but we have to learn how to reward these guys. Right. We have to learn how to reward them. But so. what gets me now, especially with, I'm not going to name anybody because I just don't feel like getting into that. Right. But like with some of the artists that we've reviewed, I don't, people hear back, no, I sit back and I'm like, man, I don't know if J-Pad really wanted to give that dude that shot. <laughs> I don't you know, know how much he gave him for that shot. You know, and that's the thing is, and, it, and, it's, and it's not personal with me. It's not personal with me. It's just the, 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 the thing that bothers me, though. It's your name on there, though. It's my name is on it. Yeah, true indeed. My name is on it, and that's true. But the thing that bothers me, though, is that I would, I would have no problem with it if it was structured properly. Mm -hmm. I could care less whether it sounds bad or not. If it's structured properly and it's in the system properly, it gives this guy a fighting chance no matter what. And that's the most important thing is, is practicing the good habit of putting it out. Yeah, it might suck. You know what I'm saying? The record, I know every record that I've done with people, they may not have lived up to the beat that I put down for them. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that happens, bro. Trust me, it happens. It's, I mean, it ain't, ain't too often that it happens on the other side, you know what I'm saying, where the beat is being overshadowed. But it is what it is, and you got to be able to accept it for what it is. Not everybody's going to hit a home run, but then again, not everybody's going to strike out. You know what I'm saying? And I have so much of a clientele and a rotation base that I can, I can be comfortable with the fact that somebody could do a record and it's not that good. And I could be comfortable with the fact that I know I got some shit coming down the pipeline that's getting ready to smack death out of everybody so you know it's 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 it's, it's the it's the, the the um the lesser of the two evils mm -hmm. the lesser of the two evils i'm happy because like i know we've had one other producer interview but i didn't get to ask that question that's something that's always weighing on me especially with you because it's like we do three reviews every week mm -hmm. almost guaranteed one of the artists has at least one of your beats on it it's not half the album <laughs> and, that's being very modest like i said that's being very modest like i said it's, yeah like i said we do three albums a week at least half of one album. Yeah, it's not like spread off across all three. Yeah, I will not even sugarcoat it, bro. I've done a lot of work and I've put a lot of hours and man hours in and 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 my goal was to master my craft. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can master the craft is you have to put the time and you have to put the work in. You have to put the hours in. You have to put the man hours in. They say you got you gotta have ten thousand hours of man hours on the job in order to master something. So I think I've probably done that about four times. You know what I'm saying? It's it's I mean, by this state of, stage of my career, you know, like, and so it's going to have that impact. You know what I'm saying? People are going to get a, a, a percentage of what it is that you do. And it's going to be a lot. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of it's going to come down the pipeline, bro. And it's not going to be up to the standard. A lot of it's going to come down the pipeline because you have to also understand, too, I might have made that track, but I might not have recorded it. Right. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, and, and trust me, you will know a difference if I recorded something as opposed to somebody else recording some or some of the other guys. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody has a, has a sauce. You understand what I'm saying? Like the top of the top. And we're not talking about just anybody. We're talking about the guys that are really right. doing this like you're Tomlins and your Stevie B's and this, that, and the third. They got a sauce. They got they got something that that that's unique that you can't really put a dollar value on. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? For real, for real. Right. And so you know, yes, and they're and they're also being utilized a lot as well. You know what I'm saying? As because I'm pretty sure as much as you've heard my beats, you've probably heard their beats on a lot of the, the production around here as well too. And it's really like we've have cornered the market. But go ahead. Go I ahead. also think it's your tag. Like 
gets us the most. Because your tag is very the distinct. tag is very distinct. Yes, <laughs> it's gonna stick out like a sore thumb, and people wanted it in there so much, bro. Even sometimes I was even like, you know what, man, let's not put it in this time. You know what I'm saying? And people were like, no, we gotta have that tucker not in there. It's gotta be in there. So I'm like, all right, yeah, it's cool, man. I just put it back in it, and it's no problem. Then I ended up starting making more of them, and I was like, fuck it, let's just keep them in there then. You know what I mean? Let's do it. You know, even now and again, every now and again, though, I still will sneak a beat in there, and you won't even know it's me because there's no uh, tag in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So there's some cast that you probably heard their track too, and it was me, but there was no tag. How do you feel about the life? And I've I've never seen any of your beats on there, so I know that you're you're handling your situation differently. How do you feel about the producers that are getting taken advantage of because they put their beats on YouTube or SoundCloud oh, and stuff like that? Oh yeah, yeah. Now I do have a little bit of a SoundCloud uh, page. But it's not set up the way everybody else's is set up. You know what I'm saying? They can't like, rip it off of it. No, they can't rip anything off of there. You can just listen to examples of what it is that I've done. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that beat's for sale either. You know what I'm saying? It's an example. So you have to hit me up and be like, yo, is this is, is this really an example or is this is this for sale? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Then I'll be able to tell you. But um, the mistake, I, again, the mistake I see these guys making, bro, is that the monetization is not there. The structure of it is not there. It's not properly structured, and, and therefore, it's not going to bring a return, bro. It's going to put you out there. It's going to make you, you know what I'm saying? And not only that, but there's other tactics that people have to learn, too, as well, when you're on those channels. There's certain things that you have to do, like people will put a beat up, and then there's no, no description. There's nothing in the description. Um, that's a mistake. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's going to look at your content if you don't have the right kind of description in there. And and those are the things that it's up to every individual to, to, to do the research and learn that, you know? It's just like going back to what I was saying about having a job, you know what I mean? Like, you can't be in the job, bro, if you don't know the, if you don't know the job description. Part of the job description are these things. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to put stuff up on YouTube, you better know what you're doing before you put it up there. If you put stuff up on SoundCloud and you want to monetize, you better know what you're doing before you put it up there like that. Now, me, myself, I'm the type of person that would encourage people to uh, utilize whatever channel, whatever system that you want to use, but you got to know exactly what it is that that's going to do for you before you actually just waste your time or or not waste your time doing it. You know what I mean? So you have to be very important. It's very important to know where, where it is that you're getting yourself into. If not, you're going to be sitting there spinning your wheels and you'll be like, why is my YouTube video not doing nothing? Because you're not doing the right thing with it. Or even worse, somebody can still you beat. Like, you'd be like easily because like, you still or get sauce from it and get and start building a, a sauce off of what it is that you've done. If you don't properly protect what it is that you're doing, you know what I'm saying? Your intellectual property. I can't stress that enough. You got to make sure that you protect what it is that you're doing. And that's one of the guiltiest things that happens because it's so easy to snatch stuff off of YouTube. Now, I know, trust me, I done did enough engineering around here to know but a pad. Just go to YouTube and get and get and get mozzie type b you know or some shit like that and and i would have to download that shit and i knew how easy it was to get it and if i know it's easy to get your beat then how easy is it to get mine mm -hmm. you know what i mean and so you have to be very very mindful of the games that you're playing and the game that you choose to play because it's going to have a positive and a negative effect now don't get me wrong some people have figured it out man and you look at those beats and they got a whole shitload of hits you know what i mean and that's what they're really concerned about too as well because some of those guys are smart enough to know that you can monetize from that you know what i'm saying as many streams as you get you get a little nice little check but the double-edged sword is once again like you said your, your sauce can get stolen if you don't have your stuff protected there's nothing that you can do about it. It don't matter if you made it or not. It does not matter if, understand me, y'all. It does not matter if you made it or not. If you do not have that shit protected in your, in your, in your person and make sure that you have all your paperwork straight on all your stuff, people can take your shit and regurgitate it and come back out with it and say, it's happened. Has, has it not? Like, yeah. like you've seen cats actually regurgitate some shit, put it out there, and then there wasn't a damn thing that the originator could do about it because they failed. To, to protect their intellectual property. And, and I can't stress it enough. You must protect it. Actually, the funniest is one, because this is actually pretty open in the public. Like, we've heard the original version and the remix of the song. But, like, Young Chop dealing with Kanye when he remixed the I Don't Like. Ooh. Young Chop was pissed because he changed the beat. He put a oh. bunch of tags on it and shit. Oh, man, listen. And I'm trying to tell you, it can get that real. Just like how, wasn't it, Jermaine Dupri was on the other day. And he was talking about... um. The one young kid that he just signed that did the OT Genesis, Genesis I'm in love with the Coco beat. Oh, yeah. And he sold the beat to OT Genesis for $200. And then OT Genesis 
took that record and he sold three million copies of the record. And and that's the point that I'm getting is that is that you have to protect your intellectual property and know the business that you're in. A lot of people look. It's great to make great music. It's great to do all that stuff. It, and as a matter of fact, it is a requirement. I'm not going to sit there and act like it isn't. It's a requirement. But outside of that, you also have to protect your intellectual property if you do not protect your intellectual property there's no do not come crying to me don't come crying to jpad because you you failed to protect your stuff or that was your hit record and it got brought out by somebody else because you failed to protect it you know what i'm saying um there was times where it did bite cats in the ash you know wiz lost i think to that one kid from the pink and yellow thing he lost he lost that debate you know what i'm saying like they found out that he actually they awarded the kid, did they not? If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm, hey, y'all can stat it up for me. But to make a long story short, you have to be very, very careful what it is you're doing with your music, with any of your property. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter if you're doing music or if you're doing, if you're selling selling watermelons. I don't give a shit what it is. You got to protect what it is that you're that you're doing, or you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose big, and a lot of people are losing and seeing a lot of records that could have did something, bro. But since it wasn't put in the channel properly, and there's even records now that that are head scratchers now. You know what I'm saying? You can go back to the history around here and and ask questions like, what happened to Dab Lord? What happened to some of these records that really were hot records? and didn't get done right because the system, they weren't put in the system properly, sir. If we, we all know what, what happens when you put shit in the system properly. Yeah. That's the result that's gonna happen. And even, man, look, even the producers will make a mistake and not think that that record's gonna do anything. And it's a bad habit, it's a mistake. It's a mistake that, that I see a lot of people make. Do not look at your stuff like it's not powerful. You look at your stuff like it's not powerful, nobody else's. Mm -hmm. My last question before I toss it over to him. Okay. Because um, this is something else that's been weird to me recently. Just because I see people losing their flash drives. Are you a one flash drive man, or do you have like multiple avenues of saving your shit? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have many, many <laughs> labyrinths of 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 storage. Uh, man, my my storage goes all the way back to '94, fellas. <laughs> Like, like I have uh, an impressive library of stuff. And so every medium you can think of from CD-ROM to DVD-ROM to, to external hard drives, the very first series of external hard drives, I, I started collecting those. I remember one time somebody broke in my crib on the east side, man, stole everything, stole the computer and all that, but they left the external hard drive because they didn't know what it was. Yeah. They thought it was just something sitting there like, I don't know what that does. Mm -hmm. So they got a computer and they thought they had everything that I had on it, but they didn't know that they just had the programs. They didn't have none of the stuff because I had everything backed up on the external hard drives back then. But no, I've, I have every medium that you can think of down there. The SD cards, flash drives, uh, exter especially external hard drives. I, mean, I have at least 10 or 11 of those, you know what I'm saying? And they all damn near full, you know what I'm saying? Like I was running, like I had a run at one point in time, bro, where I was just running through hard drives, man. I was running through hard drives. Like I was doing that much music. And that's probably the reason why you hear a lot of shit out there with my shit on it now is it's because we were just we were going ape shit, bro. I was doing everything. Like the mobile studio, I didn't even get a chance to tell y'all about that run. It was like seven years. Like I sat there and did mobile studio in the city, but that's how I got popping. That's how I really got popping. Like I, I was doing shit before then. And I, you know, my first wave was like, when these guys were teenagers, like the Kizzles, and and like like Kizzle came to me, he was 15, 16 years old. Monk, Kizzle, the whole F block thing, that all that all, and he was SK back then. And he was the only guy. He was the only guy. There was no Black J, there was no Deasley, there was no, there was no uh, Hardo, there was none of those guys. It was SK. Kizzle, shout out to Kizzle. Kizzle was the very first guy out of that whole entire outfit that really, really made some noise and decided to have the balls to come out there and do something. And then I met Monk, and then I met Black Jay, and then I met Boaz, and then I met other, all these other kids that were coming around. And they were kids when I met them, bro. Like, literally, they were still in their teens. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've known these kids since they were they're in their teens, and now they're in their damn near 30s. <laughs> and it's, it's a beautiful thing to see it all come full circle, but that's that's how much that we did, you know what I'm saying? And that's how many hard drives, because I was able to pull uh, SK's first album up when he came home. 
Like when they had the little release party over there and I gave Stevie B the keyboard, you know, and that's another thing I was telling y'all, bro, I, I'll give Cat stuff. I don't care about that. You know what I'm saying? We have to start learning how to reward people as it is anyway. But make the long story short, I gave him that shit because I had it backed up on the hard drive, bro. His very first album, bro. Like, this is the first album he ever did. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure those guys, that was, what, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 12, 13, maybe 14, 15 years ago, bro, that he did that first project. Yeah, it was like 14, 15 years ago, and I still was able to digitally remaster it. I know, I know, it's funny, I know when I die, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a very impressive library of shit for people to see. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people are gonna be able to see exactly what it is that we did. And that, and that's the mistake I also see other people making as well. And, and it's unfortunate because they really, really should be the type of people that 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 preserve what it is that they're doing. Like I, I hear producers all the time saying, if you don't have an external flash drive, or if you don't have an external hard drive and get your stuff, it's gonna get deleted over here. But guess what? When you delete that, there's no record of me knowing that you did anything on that record. And for an example, say the dude take it and he pushed the MP3 and it get hot. And then you won't have the session of the record and you just lost out on all that money that you could have made because, you look man, I, I recently, and this is just it's between everybody. <laughs> No, no, there was there was a, there was something that went down uh, with a record where the producer um, he didn't have the track house, bro, uh -huh. and the art and the artist just so happens to have a record on Billboard, and the record's on Billboard, and it needs cleaned up. So guess who they called to remake the beat? All right, so that's all. Awesome. <laughs> we ain't gonna say nothing else. And I think we can put two and two together and know what record that is. But it, it's unfortunate that that stuff happens, man, because it's like even you would think the most professional people would think to know that your intellectual property is still your intellectual property. You don't delete nothing. You don't treat anything like it's nothing. Because there's no telling. Like, I got to make sure I preserve every session that I do, bro. Right. Because there's no telling what's going to hit. There's no telling what's going to catch. If you don't keep that shit and not look at it, look, see, okay, the business isn't personal, but it'll get personal if that record hit and you ain't got your shit together. Mm -hmm. Enough said. Thanks. So you closed up shop just recently? I closed up shop recently, yeah. Are, we, yeah. are you gonna do anything on the side? Is there something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a new phase, a chapter of my career, man. I'm gonna, um. I'm going to open up the first ever custom beat shop. Okay. Custom beat shop, meaning that you can actually come if you have publishing. <laughs> you gotta have publishing. That's a requirement to come work at the custom beat shop. Um, but you will be able to get any style of beat that you want. Okay. You can actually stretch the envelope with me a little bit. We can actually push the envelope. We don't necessarily have to stay on the on the grain, mm -hmm. we can go off the grain a little bit. We can mess around and do some things that are revolutionary, actually. We can try to start something new. Mm -hmm. we, can, we don't necessarily have to stay in one place. You know what I'm saying? Like people can say, all right, Pat, listen to this beat on YouTube and get me something like it. Sure, we could do that. Or you can be like, hey, Pat, I would like to just sit here and just, just right. watch you create, but, I, but, but could you do this for me? That's what I'm looking for. That's what the custom B shop is going to be all about. It's okay. going to be like we're writing a new book. I'm already doing it anyway. I'm taking this sound and meshing it with this sound and coming up with the she go. Like there you go. That's that's a prime example of a record that that where I'm taking I'm taking trap mm -hmm. and I'm infusing it with with drumline. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And now you have a new hybrid trap. You have you have you have you have what you call marching band music, and that's what I call it, NBM. I call it marching band music. And um, since I, it was dedication to the band anyway, but that's the point of the fact that I'm getting at is that this is what this custom B shop is going to be about. It's going to be about taking uh, something from Bangladesh and taking something from uh, uh, Timbuktu and mashing that shit together, and then we're going to call it something brand new. All right. You know what I'm saying? Custom B shop. Okay. You know what I mean? 
death metal meets death. you know what i mean or oh. or or what's what's another bollywood meets you know Shit. let's let's meet it that'd be something bollywood Big, uh, industry Absolutely. I've dabbled in all of them, man. Like, I mean, by this point in my career, I've, I've literally tried everything. Mm -hmm. I've tried a little bit of this, a little bit of that, even, I mean, you name the genre, the blues, the general American genres of music. I've, I've pretty much done all of them. And I've even started to experiment with a lot of different other cultures as well, like Indian, African, uh, European, uh, even we've messed around with grime. I don't know if you guys are familiar with UK grime, but we, but I've done some UK grime. I've done a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So, you know, there's no, there's no boundary, bro. When you, when you're a musician, you'd have no boundary. You know, when you're really a musician, you have no boundary. You know what I'm saying? You said something in front of me right now, I'll try to play it. You know what I'm saying? That's just how it is. You know what I'm saying? So we have no boundary <laughs> you said it in front of us we're gonna make it happen you know what i'm saying we're gonna make it do what it do we'll make it do what it do so that's next also on top of that i want to start uh revamp the battle series for producers because i feel like everybody's been getting too comfortable and these titles have been getting too relaxed and we need to push the envelope i've been putting a challenge out to cats for i don't know how many weeks now but i periodically will come out there and i will physically challenge everybody like you think you're better than me? Let's get, let's make it happen. Now, <laughs> now we ain't just gonna be sitting there, you know. It's gonna have to be like prize fight type shit, man. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Because you gotta put me up against somebody that's either at my level or higher. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. To make me want to pull out my best shit. You know what I'm saying? Because I had <laughs> through them beat battle wars, man. I lost a lot of beat battles in Pittsburgh based off of whatever the case may be, a technicality of, you know. These cats ganged up, and it's, and they helped the producer that's on stage beat J. Pad the Juggernaut or beat whoever. You know what I'm saying? And so you know, or it was some other dynamic. But once you learn the ranks and you learn the realms, and see, once I started to win, once I started to learn how to win, I I learned how not to lose. You know what I'm saying? And and so we're gonna bring the beat battle back and make it honest again, and and really push producers again. You know what I'm saying? Like Boca, shout out to Boca, shout out to everybody. Let me get my shout outs in right now, man. Shout out to Boca, shout out to Button Pusher, shout out to everybody around the city of Pittsburgh that I can think of that I work with. F Block, Hawk Jr., uh, Ross Maisha, Ma V Sami, John Basement, Swift, 900, uh, Young Brew, um, let me give some of my industry shout outs. Project Pat, Miss Toy. Uh, let me see who else. Uh, man, there's so many people. Um, <laughs> man, shout out to Dirt Gang C. Shout out to Jimmy Wapo. Shout out to Nizzy. You know what I'm saying? Flatline Nizzy. I, everybody doesn't even know. I did all those um, underrated. That was, that was me and Nizzy. You know what I'm saying? But uh, shout out to Nizzy, shout out to Hardo, shout out to Kizzle, shout out to, you know what I'm saying, everybody. Shout out to Wiz Khalifa, shout out to Chevy Woods, shout out all these people, man. Everybody that I done worked with in the game. Shout out Manny, Emmanuel Deanda, you know what I'm saying? Uh, shout out, you know, Achilles Soon and Formula 412. Shout out Oe. shout out, you know what I'm saying? Because people don't know, I did Donks, Diamonds, and Diamonds with Oe. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, there's a lot of people that I've done projects with, you know, the, the hardcore entertainment, Shig and, and, and Grimes, who are not around, but, you know, shout out to them. Shout out to Freezy Blow. Shout out, you know, anybody that you can think of, the, that whole Get Money Gang movement, you know what I'm saying? Stevie B, Banger, uh, the whole entire uh, Loud Pack guys, you know what I'm saying? James Jr., everybody, you know what I'm saying? All the producers out here that was in the beat battles. You know what I'm saying? There ain't no disrespect to y'all that wasn't in the beat battles, but the ones that was in the beat battles, I, I got to tip my cap to every last one of y'all because you had the balls to get up and compete, compete against e each other and still be cool at the end of the day. Like some of my best friends were my competitors and they beat me in the battle, like Mysterious, Cynic Lethal. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, you know, those are cats that I lost to in the battle. You know what I mean? And I got to tip my cap to them. I respect them like I, I ain't going to lie. Y'all come and face me again, you're going to have a problem on your hands because I learned a thing or two. But <laughs> but shout out to them anyway, man. Shout out to every Mike Hit. Shout out to Hit. 
Shout out to Roscoe Wiki. Shout out, shout out everybody, man. Shout out to my whole entire city of Erie, Pennsylvania. 814, Nick I am a Don. You know what I'm saying? El Cardi. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to all these cats, man. Like that, that, that really paved the way for people to do what it is that they do. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm missing people. Lay Lansky. I'm missing, I'm missing a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? Bluey. I'm missing all kinds of people. You know what I'm saying? But I've worked with so many people throughout the years, man. Thousands upon thousands of people. I can't do nothing but say thank y'all enough for doing what it is that y'all did with me and continue to work because we ain't done yet. I might have phased out one thing, but we're nowhere near close to being done. And we're going to continue to do this until the wheels fall off. And that's just what it is. Before we switch up to the, uh, to the, what of the who and what segment? Yes. Because um, you were talking about the beat battle. One industry producer, you sit down, you want to battle them, don't win a lot, lose. Who would you be more like most? Industry? Industry. Industry wise? Mm. I would have to go to somebody real, real high caliber, man. Like, I I, I would have to go against a, a, a five level master, like, like not even Dr. Dre. He's not, he's not, not that might hurt Dr. Dre. Man. He's, oh, not, yeah. he's not ready. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Premier would be a good battle for me, but see, Primo and them, and it's no knock to them, but Primo and them is expertise at one in particular lane. I would have to go up against a Swiss beat, so I would have to go up against a, uh, somebody that dances around. A Timberland would be a very interesting interesting thing, but even yet so, Timberland has a sound. Yeah, he does. You know what I'm saying? He has a very distinct and unique sound. I would have to go against somebody that really is 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 unique individual, bro. Like they would have to be somebody that that can do a lot of different types of styles and not sound like they're too rigid into one in particular thing. Like if you like to use a bass drum or a snare a little bit too much, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. You know what I'm saying? Or if you like to use certain things, or if, if your your shit got a sample in it, but your beat still sounds a little trap, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. So you you just you just you just you just I would love to see myself in one of those capacities. Like. You name a producer that's really like 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 in that on that level right there, you put me up against him, and then then we make that type of thing happen right there. Because other than that, and I'm not sitting there bragging against or, or saying that I'm better than anybody, but I will whoop y'all in the beat battle. Whoop you, you know what I'm saying? Because I know the format, and you're gonna have to learn what I learned in order to get up or get up real early in the morning and start practicing. Because yeah. I'm gonna get you. One more thing, because it just hit me on that. The, rap, uh, the rapper producers, the Big Crits, the Coles, Kanye 10 years ago, how do you, how, how's that ever, like, a, how do you feel working with artists like that that do have the background to, to work oh, next Oh, absolutely. I would love to work with somebody like that. You know what I'm saying? I think I would turn them up, you know what I'm saying, on some real shit, because I'm just the type of person, like, anybody that's ever done a studio session with me knows that I might even be getting into the studio session more than you are. You know what I'm saying? Like I'll be around there swinging my shit around and doing all that other wild shit and, and, and having motherfuckers be like, yo, Pat is really turned the fuck up right now. You know what I'm saying? And and you ain't going to have no choice to get turned up, but to either get turned up or you're going to go home. You know what I'm saying? And be like, oh, no, Pat, you know, I'm just not working. It's just not working with me today. But no, you're going to get you're, you're going to get that energy. You're going to get that 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 fever. So I would love to work with a Kanye. I would love to work with a Mad Lib or or somebody that's really, really like a producer slash artist that really is dope or Anderson Pack. Like Anderson Pack is a guy that I can see myself really, really making a hit record with. You That's know what why I'm saying? It's funny when you brought up um, Trey because I'm like, I feel like Anderson Pack is doing a lot of the work for Trey at this point. Oh man, listen, bro. <laughs> listen, people don't know. Mm -hmm. You guys are figuring it out though. <laughs> it's these guys that you don't think are flying, are flying under the radar at the same time flying above it. But they're flying under the radar too. The Bruno Mars is in the other world and all these guys, they're, they're trust me, they're playing an instrumental part in in music itself all the way around because they're probably making it survive for real for real. You got guys like Bruno Mars that really making music survive. Like they're 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 a unique breed. They don't they don't stick to the script. Yeah. They don't stick to the script. Your Kendrick Lamars, your 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 your, your uh Drake, your you they don't stick to the script. You know what I'm saying? You give me somebody like that, I'll I'll make a hit with them. No question. All right. So before we switch up and we get to the part of the show where we say most people go from smiling to not cringing but not happy. Uh, get, get out all your tags, like your, your social media and every way to get hold of you. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. Yeah, if you want to get a hold of me, real simple, man, you could just, um, you can really just hit my phone, but but you can catch me online at, uh, just Google my name, J Pad the Juggernaut. Something's going to pop up that, that can get you to, to me personally. Twitter, uh, 
uh, Facebook, you know what I'm saying? I have a Facebook page that says JPAD, the juggernaut. You just type it in and it's just going to pop up and you can send me a message or you can call me on. I'm not weird like that. I'll take messenger phone calls. I'll take Marco Polo, whatever the fuck it is that you guys got out there. You know what I'm saying? You can, you can hit me up on all that shit, man. Instagram is official JPAD, the juggernaut. Um, I did change my name on Twitter. It is uh, Jawson311. Uh, J A H S O N, and that's my name on, on Facebook too. Just just so y'all know, because I'm not funny like that. You know what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. If you add me and I don't add you back, then you get fucked up or something. You, you know what I mean? But other than that, I'll probably add you. If I don't know, you'll probably will add you. But uh, you know, you can hit me anywhere. I'm very very accessible. You know what I'm saying? You see me at the stores, I'm not unapproachable. You know what I'm saying? You see me out in the bottle, I'm not unapproachable. Mm -hmm. At the gym for sure. You catch me at the gym five times a week. Crunch Fitness come out. See my boy Brad down there. Oh yeah, oh, oh, man. Brad is huge. <laughs> He's a, He's a this, dude, this dude is a brute. Like I'm, I'm like I get motivated looking at people like that though. But I also get motivated at the fattest person in the building. You know what I'm saying? I get motivated at the person that ain't got no arm. I ain't got. I got. To, I get motivated at the person that really is like old. You know what I'm saying? Like really old. Like I'm talking about. I see people in their 80s up in there going in and not playing no games. And I'm like, there is no excuse. Everybody should work out. Everybody should exercise. Have a better diet. Everything, man. Trust and believe. I used to be a 300 pound man, and I am 235 today. Okay. You know what I mean? And that that that's a testimony right there. I'm gonna say before we go over to Boom Up Wednesday, the one thing I do love about this interview, you basically told niggas to stay in school because yep. you basically told like I went through, I went to school and I, I was 3.9, 4.0 in my eyes. That's a round up to me. Absolutely. <laughs> he was like, you went to college, you know the technicalities of making sure your shit don't get stole, right. and then you you just said what you just said. Not like yeah. this is probably the most positive interview we've had. You're about, yeah. like, this you are is, I know what it is, man. Juggernaut <laughs> out here, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, and and I and I and I and I, and I got to give a shout out to this radio show. Because uh, the real don't really get on that much. And by you guys putting a cat like myself on, it just creates leverage. You know what I'm saying? It creates leverage. It creates balance. And that's exactly what these things uh, need. Um, you know what I'm saying? The brutal honesty, the, uh, the, 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 the cut and dry. You know what I'm saying? Because like, mm -hmm. sometimes cut and dry is what's necessary. It's not the popular route. And I say that a lot. It's not about being popular. It's about being necessary and, and doing necessary things. So pop positivity is necessary in my opinion you know what i'm saying positivity uh building you know what i'm saying but also good business practice you know what i'm saying and i can't stress that enough a lot of y'all is hurting yourselves because you do not do good business practices and you need to go back to the drawing board and i'm not trying to be funny but a lot of y'all got to go back to the drawing board and you got to go back and start right from the rip and you got to structure yourself up properly you got to get your image together. You got to get your paperwork together and you got to get your whole entire focus on on intellectual property and monetization. So y'all know what time it is. We're going to have like a for the people watching live, it's going to be like a weird five second gap where things just go silent. Y'all know what it is. So we're just cutting it 